Study period here at the British Columbia, British Columbian Camp, 1984. This is the 28th of August, Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock. Now, as previously announced, um, and in response to a request or two which I have received, we plan now to give a fairly detailed history of this movement from its very beginning up until the present moment of time. And um, this goes right back, of course, to the starting point and. Uh, I hope I can remember the details fairly accurately. I haven't, uh, for those of you here for worship, I haven't written the mouse of the rats haven't eaten them. <laughs> <laughs> now, yesterday and the day before, we looked at the great prophecies which uh, foretold the rise of this movement at this time. And I did that initially, of course, in order to lay a foundation and to demonstrate that the history which is now to be related is in fact fulfilled prophecy. And that gives us a very strong confirmation of um, God's work at this time. Now inevitably of course, in as much as I've been the leading spokesman for this message, at least some of the story will have to be my own personal experience. It will also involve the experience of others along the way as well. And I suppose then that I will need to go back to a little bit of my own background and um, give tribute to my mother, who I believe has played an extremely important role in this whole program. When she was a young girl, she was not particularly um, accepted by her social, social um, counterparts, the, the other children at school, and she spent a lot of time alone roaming in the woods. And when she was a small girl, a, a coal porter came through and sold her foster parents, because she was an adopted child, sold her foster parents a copy of Bible readings, Great Controversy, and Daniel and the Revelation. And as a girl, she um, read through these volumes, saw the strange pictures of lions with, with uh, wings and four-headed leopards and so on, without knowing what they were all about. But her interest was very definitely captivated by these strange pictures. She married young at the age of 18 and I was the eldest of three boys. My father was an avowed atheist. He'd been raised as a Roman Catholic, an Irish Roman Catholic too, which is a real Roman Catholic. <laughs> and um, the time came when the Catholic priest came to him one day and said that he was going, he was demanding that he turn in a certain portion of his wages every week to the church. My father was Irish, which means Catholic and Irish, which means bad tempered. And in fury, he virtually threw the priest out of the house and from that moment on became an avowed atheist. And when my mother attempted to give to me and to my two brothers some kind of spiritual training, he became very uh, angry about that. And one day when he caught her with a Bible in the home, he told her that if he ever caught her that way again, that he would disappear with us three boys and she would never see him or us again, which was rather a drastic threat to make, and he meant it, I do believe. So my mother very carefully hid her Bible and uh, never let him know any more that she read it. And then when I was about seven years of age, my father went fishing one night in, down to the, to the river, fell in, it was, a, it was a cold winter's night, even though it was North Queensland, came home with a chill and typhoid fever and died a few weeks later. Now I don't know my father very well, <clears throat> but I would have to say that um, it was a blessing to me that he did die at that point of time, otherwise I would have been raised a good atheist too, which wouldn't have been a very good story for, for my life. My mother at this time could see the, the approaching war clouds in Europe and she had been to the First World War, seen the boys go but not come back, and she feared that um, her three sons would be taken off in the army, they'd be killed at the front, and then she would be left without husband or child, and there was too much for her to bear. So, <clears throat> oppressed by a great sorrow, she decided to terminate her and our lives together. At this time of the year, when she made her mind to do this, the wet season was on and the river was in very high flood. And I vividly, I vividly remember standing with her and my two brothers on this... Um, uh, which I call it a little drop off of about 15-20 feet, it seemed like about 100 feet to my child mind back in those days, 
And at the foot of this vertical bank, there is the boiling, angry, muddy waters of the river just below us with whirlpools and eddies and uh, debris going by. And I learned later that my mother had planned to throw us in and herself after us and, and drown us all and end her miseries. But as she stood there, the Holy Spirit must have spoken to her mind and reminded her of those strange books that were back at her foster parents' home in Serena, North Queensland and a, a compelling desire then filled her to at last understand those books before she died. So she wrote for them. When she turn, turned around and she wrote for them. And then for hours and hours at night she um, would sit there reading those books through from cover to cover. <clears throat> and, and she understood what she read. Now the, let um, me think, yes, the outcome of that was that she became a Sabbath keeper keeping his faith from midnight to midnight because as far as she was concerned she was the only person upon the face of the earth who believed those things. And when she looked at the date lines in the book she realised the authors were dead and she, she knew nothing about a church organisation namely the Seventh-day Adventist Church organisation and so with the courage of the conviction she kept the Sabbath um, even though as far as she was concerned she was the only person upon the face of the earth doing so. That's the pioneering spirit isn't it? And I greatly appreciate that spirit and to be an inheritor of that same kind of spirit. Well, this, I, I can still remember my mother working hard Friday evening, uh, washing dishes and cleaning up the house and um, ironing our clothes so we have a nice, neat clothing on the Sabbath day. And this continued until one day another Seventh day Adventist coal porter came to her door riding a push bike. Um, as he went from place to place, a, a very poverty-stricken man, believe me. And he began to canvass her for the book uh, Bible readings. And um, my mother let him proceed so far, and then she said to him in a rather forthright manner, Sir, she said, the seventh day of the Sabbath, and you should be keeping it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was keeping it. He was a good seventh day of his cult, and he, he was astonished as she was. Um, and he said to her, well, I do keep it. Well, she said, come on in, she said, tell me more. And so he came in and Bible studies were arranged and she was baptised into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now my mother read her way into Adventism. She loved the sanctuary truth and she knew what that message was. She knew it. And when a person uh, reads themselves then they always know what the message is. Well, we, the next, the next uh, years were uh, years of growing up uh, in a tiny country school, in a tiny country community. And I won't give you all the details of those years, of course. I was baptised at the age of about 16 in a beautiful spot in the river, which we had such spots today, but we, we, we seem to lose access to these beautiful rivers anymore. Where would that have been? North, North Queensland. Queensland. Yeah, North Queensland. Up near? Mackay. Oh, yeah. West from Mackay, yeah. This is rather large. He's been to Australia lately, and uh, so he knows the geography a little bit. Thank you. Um... So um, now shortly after I was baptised, I haven't told this next little story except in the very, very close friends, so you're all privileged to hear it this time. <laughs> Pardon? We're all friends. Oh, sure you are. <laughs> so I can tell it though with safety now because what happened has, is, is being fulfilled and uh, therefore the validity of the story I don't think is under question any longer. But shortly after I was baptised, there came the annual week of prayer. And you're all familiar with that, aren't you? The, the conference puts out a little week of prayer readings and uh, the church members dutifully assemble together. They read the readings, have a prayer season and go outside and talk about the weather and the crops and so forth and go home again. <laughs> <laughs> well, the local church in Finch Hatton, 40 miles west of Mackay in North Queensland, was a very unpretentious building. It was a, a frame building seated on wooden piles about three feet off the ground with a wooden floor, uncarpeted, uncovered. It was just a, a coir matting down the aisle between two rows of seats. It would be about the length of this building, but only about two-thirds as wide. There was no ceiling. You could look up and see the corrugated iron and the spiders and all the bugs and so forth that they have at North Queensland. You looked at the walls and, and saw the inside of the weatherboards. There was no lining. So a more simple church structure didn't exist anywhere in the world, excepting perhaps in Africa where I've worshipped in uh, little huts made of um, unsawn timber and um, thatch and so on. And uh, I forgot what night it was, probably about Tuesday night, 
and present were four people. There was an elderly German farmer whose name was Alex Samuel, his blind son who sat next to me and myself and in front of us was the, was the farmer's son-in-law, a man named Jim Till. And uh, the farmer was stumbling, stumblingly reading the reading and you can imagine how a German farmer who never popularly learned English would stumble through an English reading. So there was nothing about the room which, which um, uh, g generated any kind of excitement or enthusiasm or um, uh, emotion of any kind. It was a very prosaic, a very dull situation indeed. And as I sat there, I suddenly became aware of a very soft light which filled the entire room and blotted out the room. I seemed to be in the centre of, um, of this light and I could see nothing but the light which surrounded me completely. And a voice said to me as clear as could be, I have a very special work for you to do for me. That was all that was said. Then the light faded away. And I must confess I didn't feel strange about it. I wasn't excited about it. I accepted it, accepted it in a very matter-of-fact way. But from that moment on, I had a very powerful conviction for quite a number of years that I was destined to do a work for God, which time has proved to be true. The time came I disbelieved it too, as I shall relate a little later. Now, I was determined to go to Avondale College and become a minister. I arrived there at the end of 1949, was in school during 1950 and 51, and I could tell a lot of history of that, but I won't, I won't bore you with too much detail of those, uh, those years. Then I went coalporting in North Queensland for one year in 1953. Uh, 19, uh, the bigger part, not 53. No, it wasn't 49. I went to college in 1943, that's right. In 1943 I went to college at the end of the year and started actual studies in 44 when the Second World War was on. And because of that I was exempted from military service, which was a, which was a blessing. So 44 and 45 in college, 46 I was up in North Queensland coalporting and that was quite a year of adventures. 47 I came back to one more year of school, then I was too penniless to continue. 48 I worked out, 49 I got married at the end of 49, worked in Sydney. And in 1953 I was offered a position as um, woodwork, building, construction and engineering teacher at the New Zealand Missionary College in New Zealand. And uh, it was while I was there in 1954 that the message from Wagner and Jones was recovered. And uh, even though you've heard, read the story in Boyce to Film, I'll repeat it for the sake of the tapes and the record. I want this to be a fairly complete record of um, the development of the message. Now, while I was culprit, I'll just go back for a second to, to pick up a point I'd just forgotten for the moment. Bad story time to do this, I know, but I'll do it. Uh, while I was corporate in North Queensland, I was plagued with, with sin problems and I desperately wanted to get rid of them, desperately. And I'd commit the sin, a bad habit I had, um, I'd uh, confess it, I'd weep over it, I'd tell the Lord it would never happen again. Please help me not to let it happen again. And of course it happened again, you know the old, old story, don't you? And um, I, no one could tell me quite how to get rid of this thing but one night, after a bad day of um, battling with Satan and miserable defeat, I lay in my bed in Townsville, where I was corporating at that point of time, and uh, I felt very wretched and miserable, and I said, well, I've just got to go up the mountainside, and there is a mountain in the middle of Townsville called Castle Hill. And um, so I decided I'd go up there alone on the mountain, as I read about men doing, and I'd pray and pray and pray until I got the victory. So I climbed out of bed, jumped over the back fence, walked up the mountain, halfway up it, looked down over the city lights. As I sat there, I said to myself, I said, look, I said to myself, what sort of person are you? Here you are, a big, strong, strapping young man, 21 years of age, and uh, you're letting this little habit get the better of you. Now, you, how can you possibly come before God, I told myself, and ask him to forgive you when, you when you're letting this thing beat you like this? I told myself to get down that mountain and uh, <laughs> go to work on this thing and get the victory over it, then come back and talk to God. <laughs> Can you appreciate such darkness? <laughs> Needless to say, the next ten years went by and I was still battling. And um, at the New Zealand, one of my problems, of course, was my father's Irish temper. Mind you, my main uh, inheritance, I think, is Scandinavian, which I'm more proud of than my Irish ancestry. 
Anyway, um, at the New Zealand Mystery College, I was given a class of boys to teach in woodwork and engineering and uh, general science and art eventually. And um, those, some of those boys, uh, they knew they had been relegated to the woodwork shop because they were not capable of handling the high academic subjects of English, history, mathematics and so on. And they felt a certain sense of rejection which in turn caused them to rebel against that and they came to class devoted, it seemed to me, to learning as little as they possibly can and irritating the teacher as much as they possibly could. <laughs> and believe me, they, they got me angry. They really got me angry. So angry that if it wasn't for the restraints of uh, fear that I would lose my job and my reputation, I could easily have banged their brains out against the wall. And I mean it. <laughs> I, I was furious with them. But I kept my cool outwardly, despite the boiling uh, heat within. And, um, but you know the old story, if you take a steam boiler and put a fierce fire underneath it and, and stop all the hatches so there's no outlets uh, to release the pressure, that boiler's going to eventually blow up and blows, oh my, how it can blow. And inevitably I would be home on the weekend with all this pressure built up and um, my children would say something out of place and my wife would say something out of place or do something out of place and, and then the eruption would come. And my family would uh, bear the brunt of what the boys ought to have uh, borne or which had never been at all anyway. Well, when all the pressure was gone and there I was deflated, I would be so deeply repentant once more and... Uh, <laughs> it wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> And I would kneel down and with tears I would repent and, and when I think of the agonizing struggle you read about, we read about yesterday in early writings, I certainly went through it in a very real way. And I came to the place in the end where I more or less uh, accepted the idea that um, in this life we can't have victory over sin. My, my logic was, well, there's no one trying as hard as I am, or at least certainly no one's trying harder, no one prays more earnestly than I do, no one works for the cause of God more incessantly than I do and if I can't get this experience then nobody can especially when around me college presidents and ministers and teachers and so forth all confess to more or less the same kind of problem and then it was that um, down in the South Island of New Zealand a young man named John Martin was one to the Adventist church he passed briefly through Longburn as a visitor on his way to Avondale College I saw his face but nothing more while over there he and Bob Brinsmead John Slade and several other people got involved in the rediscovery of the Wagner and Jones books and at the end of the year John Martin came back to New Zealand absolutely fired with this wonderful new message although I, I'm quite sure it was superficially but he was really fired up with it and um, one I think Sunday morning uh, I hadn't actually met him officially or formally yet but one Sunday morning I stepped out of my house and went down to the woodwork shop I paused at the boiler room and as I came around the corner there he was hanging out his personal laundry on the clothes lines which were attached to the back end of the woodwork shop. And instead of, and he saw me coming, he, was, he, he and I were meeting alone, and instead of saying, well, how do you do, my name's John Martin, what's yours? He said to me, hey, he said, have you heard about Wagner and Jones, 1888, Butler, Rejection, Justification by Faith, Righteousness by Faith, and why he went, <laughs> <laughs> and not one word made a scrap of sense to me. No, not a word of it made sense to me. It was all, it was all just a, a jumble of ideas and thoughts that he was presenting. If I had had some background, it would have made sense. I had no background at all in the Wagner and Jones ministry. <coughs> and um, um, what was I going to say now? Yes, I, as I said the other day, or yesterday, I had been a very, very diligent student of church history, medieval church history, Adventist church history, Bible church history. I read everything I could get on those, on those subjects. I knew all about Miller and Himes and Fitch and Litch and Snow and Eld Elder James White and Ellen White and Luthber and Bates and so forth, but nothing about Wagner and Jones. And so as I, as I politely listened without uh, interruption, uh, he finally stopped in midair and said, Say, he said, do you know what it means to have living victory over every now and every day? Well, that was too much. I just laughed. Absolutely out <laughs> laughed outright. I said, look, John, I said, I knew his name but now somehow the other, I said, look, John, I said, um, for the last 12 years I have been battling against sin, 
I have begged the Lord for victory, I have wept, I have prayed, I have repented, I have done my level best. And I, still, I said it makes no difference. I still sing the same as if I hadn't said a single praying word. And I said, I know that God loves me and that um, when I sin today and tonight I go home and kneel down and, and say to the Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me, the Lord says, I forgive you. And the great judgment day, the Lord's going to say, well, let's look at Fred's record. Mm, he sure tried hard, didn't he? Well, <laughs> because he tried so hard, a mentor would give him a place in the kingdom. Again, what darkness. And John Martin looked at me as if to say, brother, you need help. <laughs> and did I ever need help? But he didn't say that, he just looked it. Then he said to me, um, quite sincerely, look, he said, can I come across to your place and give you a Bible study? Well, I, I, I love that idea. I always loved the Bible study. As I said, yes, there was one of those people who was getting a ray of light occasionally from Jesus during that period of time. And I loved the Word of God. I loved working f for the Lord in the church and so on. So it was arranged. He came across on Sabbath afternoon and um, we, we entered my living room, which, which, was, which wasn't even furnished. All I could do was put around a few old uh, chairs uh, without padding there was no carpet on the floor no curtains on the window I was poor back in those days believe me not so much richer now <laughs> and uh, he sat there with his books on his knees there was no table or desk to work on and um, he gave me what I have to classify as one of the poorest Bible studies I've ever heard in my life one of the poorest he would read a Bible text sin shall not have dominion over you Romans 6 verse 14 and then he'd pause as if to make a comment on that verse and he'd be sort of tongue-tied and say nothing. So the Saviour's embarrassed me to read another verse or spirit prophecy statement and again the same thing would happen. And he ended up doing nothing more than in a kind of embarrassed way or an awkward way reading Bible texts and spirit prophecy statements. No comments, nothing, just the statements and the verses. So if every person got a raw Bible state, that was a raw one. So I copied every reference down and when he was finished I argued against him very sceptically. I said, oh, I said, John, that's too good to be true. I mean, look at my experience. You show me the perfect man and I'll believe what you have to say and all these kind of arguments. And John, <laughs> I'll never forget the, the way he walked out. He walked out with his shoulders down, his head down, his feet scuffing the ground. <laughs> he must have been saying, he's a hard one, that one. <laughs> Poor man, I felt sorry for him to this day. But over the next two or three days, I began to see men like trees walking and things began to assume some form and the idea began to be attractive to me and reasonable to me and I even found myself arguing in favour of the idea. And then came Wednesday um, of the following week, uh, that's about four days after that Sabbath, Sunday morning, yeah, four days after the Sabbath, and my wife had gone to town with uh, the two children we then had and I was home alone and incredibly I wasn't busy for about an hour. Now as a woodwork teacher I worked, really worked very, very hard at the college. The Adventist Church really knows how to get the utmost out of their workers. No one is, it's a big booming business organisation. But this afternoon God arranged it somehow that I had free time. I think most of the boys had gone to town. I didn't have to supervise a work program. And I thoughtfully found myself going home to my house <clears throat> and uh, I sat down at this table, took out this list of statements, Bible, Bible text and spirit prophecy statements, and I sat down and began to reread them one by one. And looking back now, I can really see in the plainest possible way the, the Holy Spirit actually arranging the whole thing. And I got about one third of the way down that list of statements when, with tremendous power, the conviction came to me. It hit, it hit me like a whole mountain falling on me. It was a tremendous, tremendous shock, to say the least of it. But the conviction came to me that if I believed as I did, that I could not have a personal experience of victory over every known sin every day, then this was to testify that Satan is stronger than God, that sin is more powerful than righteousness and that wickedness prevails in this world and, and this is the kingdom of Satan and there's no, no deliverance from it. Now, when your belief is put into such crystal clear terms as that, you know that you don't have a correct belief because sin is not stronger than righteousness, Satan is not stronger than God and wickedness does not enjoy undisputed sway in this world. And when I saw what the real nature of my witness had been, when I saw I had been a witness to Satan's power and therefore the builder of his kingdom, 
That's what I saw about myself. It was a horrifying thought. Now, prior to that point of time, I had uh, rested, as most Adventists do, in my church membership, in my position as a college teacher, the fact that I was a, a zealous, ardent missionary leader, the fact that I loved to study God's Word, I read the book Desire Ages through at least seven times, and all of those things that said, well, if anyone's going to go to the kingdom, you certainly are, aren't you? Look at all your good works. And then, but this day, not only did those works disappear as a, a, an evidence of my salvation, they now became an evidence of my damnation, because I saw that my position as college teacher, my zeal for God's work, my love of Bible study and all that only made my witness for Satan more effective because Satan could say, now look, here's a college teacher. Here's a man who studies his Bible every day. Here's a man who's zealous for the cause of God and he can't get the victory over sin. So what hope do the rest of you, what, what hope do the rest of you to get victory over sin? And when I saw that my life was a living witness to Satan's power, that I was building his kingdom, that I was his servant, then there came a, the, the Lord gave me the grace to absolutely admit it. I, I had no disposition to argue with the conviction. And since that time I have found that um, as I've taught Romans 7 and 8 and deliverance from the bondage of sin, I've seen the Spirit of God bring people to that same point of conviction and they backed up and said, uh-uh, that's not me, look, look at my zeal, look at my good works, look at my love of the truth. I am God's child, I can't accept that picture about myself. And that's a fatal mistake. When the true witness comes and tells us we're wretched, miserable, poor and blind, we'd better believe it. Even though we can't see it, let's just believe it because he says so. And so I just sort of um, resigned myself to accepting this awful witness about myself and in that self-same moment, I felt, I felt as I've never felt before since the, the blackness of hopeless eternal despair. I saw myself as I was an eternally, hopelessly lost soul. And the same instant that I, I accepted that conviction and saw myself as such the promises of God which I had just been reading, <clears throat> they, they came off that page as if they had been written just for me. As if God had said, well, Fred Wright needs these promises, we'll write them just for him. Of course, they're not written just for me, I know, but it, uh, that's how it came through to me. And if you read the conversion of John Wesley, remember, he said the same thing, that it appeared to him as if the promise had been written just for him as he came to that meeting of the Moravians that night. Now, <clears throat> the moment that the promises glowed with life and assurance to me, I dropped down beside that table and I prayed a very simple prayer. I don't remember now what I said, but I know it only lasted for about 30 seconds, maybe a minute at the most. But I can, I can sort of um, remember the general drift of the prayer. It went along this line, Lord, now I know what my problem is. My problem is not what I have been doing. That's the part of what I am. And I don't want to be that kind of person anymore. So here's my old nature, dear Lord, you take it, it's no longer mine, I'm finished with it. You've got it, and I receive your life into its place. And I thank the Lord most of my knees. Now, I didn't look for any evidence at all as I was born again, I just knew it. I absolutely knew it. <clears throat> now, I'd like to spend a moment stressing this point because remember that this movement is built upon that experience or that message of deliverance from the bondage of sin. That's what the movement's all about. And uh, if a person does not, through this movement's message, gain personal deliverance from sin, then he has not really become, become a member of this movement and is not a wise virgin. Now, when the man came from Capernaum to Cana to ask Jesus Christ to heal his son, that man came with reservations. And Jesus said to him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And when Christ spoke those words, they came, they penetrated that man's darkened mind and laid bare his soul. And that man saw the real nature of his approach to Jesus Christ. And as he realized Christ's power to bring to him such personal conviction, his faith then reached out and laid hold upon the power of Christ, which was now manifested to him. And as he laid hold upon that power, he received the blessing and he knew he was, he knew his son was healed and he knew that himself also was delivered from the power of sin because both blessings were given to him that day. Now that man could very easily have gone home that day. He didn't bother. 
he didn't need to go home. He knew his son was well. He didn't have to go back and touch the warm skin and see the bright eyes and see the boy running around the house. He didn't need that. That would come later. But he knew by faith in God's word, by the experience of his pastors, he was a born-again Christian. He knew his son was well. Now I find that one point I have to get across to people is this, that when you kneel down and make your contract with God, go through the procedures outlined in acceptable confession of bondage to freedom, and you rise to your knees and you start expecting to be a different person and looking for the differences in your life, and uh, when you don't see them, you begin to doubt what you have done, then you're in the category of the person of whom Christ said, except you see signs of wonders you will not believe. Don't do it. Just don't even think about looking for evidences and, and witnesses that you are a born-again Christian. Just believe it because God has said it, and that's the altogether important approach in this matter. Now, when I gained that experience back in 1954, or was it 55? I'm not sure now exactly whether it was 54. I think it was 54. It could have been 55. Probably the early part of 55. It happened the early January 55. It had to be. Um, I, I, I went that experience, and I wasn't. I, I remember quite well. Now, I didn't look for anything. I didn't look for ecstasy. I didn't look for a changed life. I just knew I'd given all the problems to God, and I rested in Him. And it was a very, very sweet and lovely experience, believe me. I didn't have any great desire to run around and tell the world either. And it was three weeks later that um, I first realised an evidence which told me I was, in fact, a different person. And that's the Model A story, <laughs> which you've all read. I'm sure I'll tell it again for the sake of the complete record. We had back in those days a 1929 Model A, and this was 1950. Uh, Four, so you can imagine how old the car was. Produced in America by Henry Ford, shipped out to New Zealand. It had done thousands and thousands of busy miles and was still going strong. I should say chuffing along, because <laughs> they do chuff along, those old cars. And uh, it was a temperamental car, though, and uh, quite frequently it would break down in most inappropriate moments. Little things, you know, a loose spark plug or some, some, something silly. And my wife uh, spent a lot of time in that car, going to town. She was involved in welfare work and she was buying stuff for sales of work and so on. And every, every so often I'd get a call from town to come and rescue her because the car wouldn't go. <laughs> she couldn't afford to call a mechanic because we just didn't have that kind of money. I think mean, the car probably cost us about $60 to buy in the first case anyway, or even less than that. So I would uh, go in and, and I'd get called from an extremely busy, pressing program. I just didn't have time to be running after a temperamental car. And I'd go in there and I'd skin my knuckles or something that I was pulling a wrench and then, then the temper would come boiling out and she'd, she'd catch it. Well, I told myself, next time I'll, I'll, keep my, I'll keep my cool next time I told myself. And maybe once or twice I actually did. I don't remember if I did or not. But invariably, usually, uh, even though I resolved to keep my cool, I would go in there and uh, all would be well for the first two or three minutes, then something would happen, I'd burn the fingers in the hot radiator or whatever, and I would explode again. Why can't you stay home for once, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, about three weeks after, I had discovered the beautiful gospel of deliverance from the bondage of sin, there came a certain Friday afternoon, which is the worst afternoon of the week. That's when the boiler breaks down, the sewage is plugged, plugged up, the washing machines fall apart. Everything goes wrong on Friday afternoon at Adventist College. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, the maintenance man, which is what I was, as what his teacher, uh, usually is frantically trying to get everything back into normal shape before the Sabbath comes again. And this particular afternoon, I was also struggling to get a Sabbath school lesson ready for the next day, when about 3.30 in the afternoon, I get the telephone, I know someone drops by, I didn't have a telephone then, someone drops by and says, your wife is up at the cooperative about two miles away, which was a, like a, a food market, and the car is broken down, and she wants you to go and bring her home. So I, I laid aside my books and stepped out, uh, to the roadway and was fortunate in uh, that Peter Young came by and he was going in that direction so I hitched a ride with him. I got up there, uh, I found her standing beside the vehicle, I walked over and said, well what's wrong with it this time? Uh, not angrily at all. And worked on it for a few moments and, and had no success so she needed to get home and uh, get ready for Sabbath too. So I said, look, I said, there's Brother Hayward. 
he'll take you home because he's going that way and I'll bring the car home as soon as I possibly can. So she went off by herself and somebody towed, towed me back home and I pushed the car in the garage and forgot about it until Sunday morning when I could work on it and fix it. I finished the day's work, I came home for supper, we went to the evening Vesper service, we came home and went to bed. And uh, I was pretty weary, so I was just about to fall asleep when she was lying there very, very quietly for a long time. Then she said to me, what's happened to you? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She said, something's happened to you. She said, I wonder what it is. And I had the least idea what she was talking about, not the least suspicion of what she had in mind. I just couldn't figure where anything was different or changed. I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, I've got no idea. Explain yourself. Well, she said... I know you, she said. <laughs> and I was waiting up there by the car today for the usual explosion that didn't come. So I said to myself, wait till he gets home. Just wait till he gets home. <laughs> but you came home and nothing happened. So I said, all right. She said to herself, wait till he gets back from the Vespa service. Then I'll catch it. He's just storing it up this time. And she said, again, nothing happened. Now she said, I said, all right, where do we go to bed? Then I'll really catch it. <laughs> but she said, you're about to fall asleep, nothing's happened. She said, what's happened to you? She said, something has happened, I want to know what it is. And for the first time, I suddenly realized that I had simply been living out my new experience, that my new life was coming through. And uh, <clears throat> I found myself saying, it's the Lord's doing this marvelous in my eyes. And I was so overwhelmed, I couldn't say a thing to her at all. I, could, I didn't explain it at all. I just shrugged my, sh my shoulders and we went to sleep. And uh, so it took three weeks before the first visible evidence came through that God had wrought a miracle in my life experience. And I was very, very glad and grateful for it. In fact, my gratitude was overwhelming and, and it brought tears to my eyes. And I found myself spontaneously saying, it's the Lord's doing. I recognized I hadn't done it. He had done it and was marvelous in my eyes. Yeah. Marvelous after all those years of bitter struggles, of defeats and so forth, to find that whereas by nature I had done the things of wrath before, by nature I had exhibited a bad temper, now by nature I was exhibiting a, a, a patience and a coolness which was so natural I didn't even notice it. And that, that, that to me was something that was extremely marvelous and which I have been very grateful for ever since. I do like the fact that in this message we don't have this Romans 7 experience of victory today and defeat tomorrow and victory the next day and defeat the next day. It's an abiding experience provided of course we carefully maintain it. It just, it just doesn't come and go uh, like that. Well as I said I had no great urge to run around the world and proclaim this to everybody but as I shall relate in the next study period, uh, well story period now, uh, about this time things began to pardon about, about this time things began to happen in the world over in America uh, Will in a short had already begun their work the uh, happenings the reactions were taking place at the general conference over in Australia things were beginning to build up toward uh, exciting developments and of course then in New Zealand they also were moving in the same way but even though I had not purpose to run around telling the world about this new experience um, it soon became evident to needy, hungry souls in the college that I had something that nobody else had. I don't know how they knew it, I guess they sensed it. The same as the woman of the world sensed it when Christ spoke to her. And very soon I found people coming to me asking me questions about how to get the victory over bad temper, how to put away evil desires, how to achieve peace of heart and mind. And we began to have the most lovely Bible studies, just sitting down together quietly and going through Romans 7 and 8 and uh, the great promises of God. And I saw young people at the school gain some really positive victories over sin as a result of that early work back then. I hope that some of them someday will uh, bear fruit, although when the pressure came from the church later against the Waggard and Jones message, um, they, they fell away under the pressure. Now at that time, of course, I knew that history was being made, that this was not just a, 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 that my experience was not something detached from history, but that it was something which was very much a part of history. And um, I knew that the 1888 message was being recovered, that a new day was dawning, and naively and innocently I expected the Seventh-day Adventist Church to welcome these great truths as much as I was doing. I felt that they were, they, were, they were honest people, they were very dedicated people 
and that they, they couldn't possibly gainsay the evidence, that they would have to accept the fact that God had sent the message back then, that the message had been lost for a long time, the books had been taken from the library shelves, nothing had ever been taught about those men or their message, but now to come again, I was so sure the church would jump up and down with sheer joy and gladness, would grasp these great truths, the presses would roll and Wagner and Jones's books would take the place of all the other nonsensical books in, 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 the, in the ABC stores and we'd see a wonderful revival and reformation surge around the world in just about three weeks' time the Lord would come. <laughs> such, such were my happy anticipations. But um, the next thing, um, John Martin was invited to give, to take a Sabbath school lesson and uh, or probably on, and the church pastor was not present at this time he was away and didn't hear the presentation and uh, I heard the um, accountant who was there at that point in time talking to the, to the church pastor and really expressing his deep concern and alarm at the sentiments expressed by John Martin which sentiments of course were the Wagner and Jones message and very soon after that I began to uh, see an increasing reaction of negativity on the part of the church, of hostility and anger. And it wasn't very long before I found myself being called a heretic, a schismatic, a dangerous man and so forth. And then the battle was really on from that point of time on, but that, that part will be the subject of our next study period together. But I was amazed, and I still am amazed, at the uh, reaction that message brought in the church, especially from the ministry. They were, they were absolutely alarmed by it. And, and that to me was an amazing thing because the message was so sweet, so beautiful, so effective, so so scriptural. And above all, it bore the divine credentials, a direct uh, statement by Sister White that this was a message sent by God through his servants, Elders Wagner and Jones, to the Seventh-day Adventist Church people. It had been lost, it had come again. It's the fourth angel in verity and it will do its work and it certainly has been doing it in the last 20 years the most remarkable fashion. So we'll stop at that point and pick up the story in our next study period. I hope you're enjoying it and we'll find this to be helpful. I'm telling you because I'm asked to, not because I'd planned to. Right, the time now is um, almost 5 to 11.30.